Good. Well, it, it's, a, it's, a pleasure, it's a pleasure being with all of y'all um, and to start off an, an important conversation. Um, I, I've told this story before, but a month after I was born, I was born in August of 1977, NASA put Voyager 1 into space. And when the engineers and scientists developed Voyager 1, they thought it was going to last for four or five years. It's still reporting back today. It was the first man-made object to go into interstellar space. Right, well, a lot of what we learned about our universe, we learned from Voyager 1. When I was in school, Pluto was a planet. Um, now it's not a planet, but I think Pluto's a planet again. So uh, I'm pro-Pluto being a planet. Um, and do you know what the onboard memory of Voyager 1 was? 40 kilobytes. That's crazy. Right? That's a Word document. The pictures y'all are going to take today wouldn't even fit on Voyager 1. That was 42 years ago, right? Um, what's the next 42 years is going to make the, the technological change we've seen in the last 42 years look insignificant. And you know, as a computer science major, if any of y'all have uh, Fortran 77 problems, let me know. And that's my, that's my expertise. Um, you know, learning computer science in the late 90s, I, I never would have anticipated the rapid advancements that we've seen in, in internet and in information technology. And, and as I've said, and I can't say this enough, the technological change we're going to see in the next 30 years is going to make the last 30 years look insignificant. And American dominance in advanced technology is not guaranteed. We must maintain American leadership in next generation technology um, because it's been an essential part of our nation's political and economic power since the, the Second World War. And, and unfortunately, we've entered an age where U.S. military and economic dominance is no longer guaranteed. In this new age, a leadership in advanced technology will determine who sets the rules of the road in the global economy and, and the international system that we live in. And if we lose, if America loses its adv advantage in technology, it will have a devastating effect on our economy and national security. We can't uh, let this happen. That's why I'm glad there's folks like y'all that, that care about this. And technology in the wrong hands also threatens our values and the very underpinnings of our free society. China is not using facial recognition to make it easier to buy groceries with your face. They are using it to continue to oppress their citizens. Right now in Xinjiang province, the Chinese government has erected a, a technological surveillance state that has brought Orwell's 1984 into the 21st century. Hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs are being tracked daily for potential disloyalty, and more than one million have been arbitrarily detained in concentration camps. The silence in the West about China's use of technology to oppress an entire ethnic group only serves the interests of the Communist Party, and it also ignores, um, and, and, and this, is, this technology is gonna be used to export to the other parts of China, and then they're gonna use it to export it to autocratic uh, regimes. So this is something that China um, is interested in doing, and nations choosing to invest in advanced technology now are deciding the norms for the rest of the world, and it's going to be with or without us. And, all, and a number of ethical dilemmas are going to arise, and the answers are not clearly defined. Should an algorithm decide how long someone is sentenced to prison or whether or not he or she gets bailed? Can a machine kill another machine? Can a machine kill a human without a human making that decision? Should we abdicate leadership in this arena? If we do, then we leave a vacuum for authoritarian countries to put their spin on global warfare, privacy, and bias standards. A, a possibility that threatens the openness that has made the internet a force for freedom and prosperity around the world. China's gonna always have more data than we do. Thinking that we're going to be able to beat them at that game is, is foolhardy, in my opinion. So we have to be de developing algorithms that take less data to run it, because the Chinese don't care about privacy, they don't care about civil liberties, and they have more of it. And these are some of the difficult challenges that we're going to have to face in, in, the, in now and the coming months. And, and China has been clear about its intentions. In 2015, it released their Made in China plan. 
And in that, and that plan, they state that by the year 2049, that's when China celebrates 100 years of communist rule in the mainland, that they want to be the leader in advanced technology and manufacturing. So we know what they want to do. So we have to ensure that we lead in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and other technology that are going to define um, this, this century. And that's why the government should work towards things like a national strategy uh, to coordinate across the government, across academia, across the private sector, um, in order to develop a plan on how to adopt an AI across, across sectors. Uh, creating a national strategy will better prioritize limited government resources and more rapidly advance uh, American AI technology. And this is one reason why I've partnered with my friend, um, I would call him my partner in crime, uh, Robin Kelly from Illinois. And then we're working with the Bipartisan Policy Center to develop an AI strategy that Congress can pass and get behind. And the goal is to get that done this year. This will include several key priorities. Um, first, we have to dramatically increase the resources devoted to research and development. The government should set an example and lead the way in adopting AI, uh, which is going to save taxpayer dollars and make government more efficient. Additionally, we have to address the ethical, ethical questions raised by AI systems across different fields. And this is something that I actually think Congress is well positioned uh, to play a leading role in shaping. Federal standards and, and regulation can't get in the way of AI innovation. And instead, regu regulation should focus on addressing ethical security and privacy concerns that are not covered by existing frameworks. And guess what? In AI, we already have rules against bias. We always ha already have rules against discrimination. And those algorithms should follow those rules that are already on the book. It's actually not that hard. Um, that's up to the developers to figure out how to ensure that that, that gets implemented. And, and finally, these efforts in developing a national strategy on AI should advance emerging technologies. Um, and and it, we can't advance those emerging technologies if we don't have enough qualified professionals um, to stay competitive in the new economy. We have to develop a workforce of the future that can tackle these new collar jobs. And the, the crux of the problem is this. We have to prepare our workforce for disruptions not seen since the Industrial Revolution. And we must train our kids for 21st century jobs that don't exist today. And to meet this challenge, we're going to have to mobilize educational, government, private resources, private sector resources at every level, and from national programs to community colleges to elementary schools. And for the current workforce, reskilling and continuous education and workforce development will be key to adapting our economy to these changes. Um, researchers in fields like AI are, are in high demand. We all know that. Seven-figure um, salaries around the globe. But right now, we don't have enough computer scientists or skilled tech technicians to compete in this global economy. I'll give you some stats. In Texas alone, uh, 38,000 open computing jobs. And the average salary was about $93,000, which is double the state average. I always tell parents in my district, um, make sure your kids learn computer science. And unfortunately, with those number of positions just in Texas, we're not meeting, our educational system is not meeting that demand. Um, in 2017, the last time we have reliable data, Texas universities only graduated 3,500 computer scientists. Right? Or, and of that, only 19% were female. Those are terrible numbers. And these, these, these educational efforts will, will also require a, a broader computer science pipeline that focus on fundamental skills um, to master AI and, and these new careers. And the fundamental um, uh, issue there is coding. Coding is the language of the future. And if our students can't speak it, they're going to be left behind. And the only way we ensure that qualified talent pipeline is we have to introduce coding earlier in, in, the, in our educational system. We have to start in middle school. I can make an argument that we should be starting in elementary school. And another thing we should be doing is working to streamline legal immigration so that America continues to be the beneficiary of the brain drain from other parts of the world. There are a million international students studying in the United States, including about 360,000 from China. The best and brightest from around the world are being educated right here. And we need an education system that allows them to stay here, uh, particularly in, in STEM fields. And look, real simple for me, if China wants to steal our secrets and continue to steal our IP, we should be stealing their engineers and scientists. 
And the, the bottom line is if we want to survive and thrive in this technological age, we need to place computer science at the top of our priority list when it comes to education. And the, the only way we can pull this off is if we actually um, work together. And this is something that we've seen work down in the 23rd District of Texas. These advances in, in technology are creating new security risks that are, that are affecting our, our lives. The, the benefits are, are clear, but for millions of Americans, uh, one of these threats from new technology is robocalls and phone scams. It's insane. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but when my phone rings multiple times a day and, and I hear about, hi, I'm calling about your student loans, right? my blood pressure goes up. And let me, let me here, here are some crazy stats. 50% of all the calls made to cell phones are spam calls. And Americans receive over 1.3 million spam calls on a weekly basis. Um, but these calls are more than just a nuisance. The scams they perpetuate have cost Americans millions of dollars. In, in 2018 alone, 25 million Americans reported fraud as a result of robocalls. And that's why I'm proud that just before the holidays, uh, we in Congress passed in an overwhelmingly bipartisan bill. Uh, now, you don't hear about this in the news much. You know, Nobody ever clicks on, a, on an article that said Congress worked. Right? Um, but we, we passed a, a bipartisan bill that deterred criminal um, unsolicited robos, robocall scams, and it gave uh, federal officials more tools to find scammers, increase penalties for those who are caught, and promote the use of caller identification uh, to identify and stop robocalls. It's called the TRACED Act, and it was a great step in the right direction, but we have to remain vigilant because just as hackers are developing new methods of attack, uh, once a patch has been made, the tactics and techniques utilized by these robocallers are going to continue um, to evolve. Um, we all are aware of the growing cybersecurity threats facing the government and the private sector. Just like robocallers, cyber criminals are increasingly operating like businesses, using hacking as a tool for profit. A recent study by, by Verizon estimates that 71% of breaches were financially motivated. And chillingly, cyber criminals are sharing their data, their tools, their expertise to advance the, the, their operations as fast as the marketplace allows. The news is full of debilitating hacks against banks, major corporations, and even the U.S. government. Um, we all, everybody in the country now knows what OPM stands for, right? We, we know that. Uh, Equifax, none of y'all gave Equifax your information. Um, Target and Marriott, you know, I'm a, I'm a Bonvoy member, you know, so that one was a little uh, too close to home. Um, <clears throat> but these, these hacks compromise um, um, the personal data of millions of people. And while network technology is, is making our life easier, uh, this is also increasing our surface area of attack. Um, again, the numbers speak for themselves. Last year, 140 million spam emails were sent. That's every day. And uh, that's 55% of all the global email traffic. 400,000 new forms of malware are unleashed daily, on top of the more than 600 million that already exists. And a large, an average large U.S. corporation experienced 54 million security events just a couple of years ago. And the average time to identify a breach, and this is, this is according to last year, it's 206 days. That's a terrible stat. And, and rapid advances in IoT will only increase our vulnerability to attacks. And, and by the end of this year, it's estimated that about 20 billion IoT devices will be connected to the internet. And many of those um, already have uh, security vulnerabilities are putting on, on large networks. Many of these devices are shipped with factory set hard-coded passwords. This represent a weak point that leaves the rest of the network vulnerable to an, an attack. IoT devices have been used by bad actors to launch um, devastating attacks against websites, hosting service ISPs, and, and given the challenges every day that the federal government faces with cybersecurity, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly concerned with the threat that IoT devices are going to introduce to our network. And um, that's why I work with, with, with Robin, um, Senators Warren, Warner from Virginia, and Senator Gardner from Colorado to introduce an IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act. It's real simple. If you're going to introduce IoT 
into your device and it has a known vulnerability, you got to have a plan to patch it. Right? This isn't this isn't rocket science. Um, this is a simple step to make sure that the government is prepared for the rapid introduction of, of IoT. The challenge we face is not whether next generation technology will be transformative and disruptive, but how will we manage this oncoming disruption? Will we let overwhelm an underprepared government and leave the US and our allies unable to keep up with our adversaries? Will we let our society fall behind and fail to harness the possibilities created by advanced technology for foregoing innovation that can improve the lives of tens of millions of people? Or are we going to meet these challenges head on, as we have many times before, and mobilize the resources of our nation, society, and allies um, to grasp the opportunities before us? We must make sure the United States remains the most important economy and innovation center of the world. And we must make sure that the values of the free world, not autocracies, um, guide the development of technology. We must take advantage of technology before it takes advantage of us. These are the fundamental challenges we face in the 21st century, and I'm confident we will rise to the occasion. And I just want to thank the Internet Education Foundation for what y'all do with the App Challenge, for bringing um, these, group, the, these folks together, and for the research.